Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for inviting me to Geneva. Thank you for inviting me here, and I've got a couple of friends with me as well. So I'm not on my own in the city, in the big bad city of Geneva. Um, and well done for getting up on a Saturday morning and coming to this. Um, I'm an alcoholic, and so it's amazing to me that I'm anywhere today, let alone Geneva. I came into AA for the first time in the 19, early 1990s, and most of the people that I met around that time are not anywhere anymore. Uh, so the fact that I'm alive is amazing to me. Uh, and alcoholism in my family, those of us who are alcoholics tend to die young. My brother was in his 20s when alcoholism killed him. I'm in my 40s now, so I've got you know a good few years uh, that I, by odds I shouldn't have, really. Um, they say a very, very high proportion of alcoholics die drunk. I don't know what the proportion is technically. I'm not here as a scientist or a, I'm not here to report statistics. But I'm aware, I'm very aware that I was going to say lucky that I'm alive. I'm not sure how much luck has to do with it, but then again I'm not in charge of the universe, so who knows really. Um, why am I, why am I still alive, um, being an alcoholic as I am after all these years? I suppose that's the point of what my story is, is why I'm still here. Um, I'm not still here because I'm a good person. I'm not still here because I'm clever. I'm not still here because I'm nice. I'm still here because Alcoholics Anonymous works. Um, it really does, but it doesn't work because I walked in through the doors and sat down and listened, although that was surely necessary if I hadn't walked in, if I hadn't sat down, if I hadn't listened, I wouldn't be here. I'm still here. My sobriety date is the 24th of July, 1993, um, so I'm, I'm something over 20 years sober now. Uh, I believe the reason I'm still here is because I broke, I gave up. I realized that my way of living did not work on any level. And I was willing to say to people who I trusted, just tell me what to do, show me what to do, show me how to live differently than the way I've been living. And I knew that my way of living had failed. I knew my way of living failed before I ever drank. I remember at the age of 11 or 12, Realizing that the universe had nothing to offer that I was remotely interested in. I turned my face to the wall and said to the universe, go away, I'm, I just leave me alone. I just want to wait until the whole thing is over. I remember making the mistake of mentioning how depressed I was to my family. And, um, my mother said, oh, well, we're all depressed. Just, we'll just have to get used to it. Um, now, I might add that my mother is French, which may explain something <laughs> of this response. My father was English and cheerful. <laughs> and here's an interesting thing. I have the example from a very early age of my mother's negative neurotic thinking, God bless her. And I saw the effect of this, which was anger and frustration and enormous tension wasn't a relaxed household I grew up in. <laughs> if my father made the mistake of coming back from the supermarket with the wrong type of milk or the wrong type of grapes, there would be hell to pay. I have this example, and then I have the example of my father who was cheerful, relaxed, happy-go-lucky. He'd had his difficulties, but for, for whatever reason, in whatever way, he'd gotten over them. And he just took life as it, it came. Um, he didn't worry about things on the principle that worrying didn't help. He got on with people. He made himself useful. Now, I have these two examples, 
And from an early age, you'd have thought I would have observed which way of living worked best and I would have copied it, but I didn't have the power to do that. I grew up as an identical copy of my mother, baffled by my father. I had the information there. Information is not my problem. Lack of power to change, lack of power to become what I need to become was my problem. Um, alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol's wonderful. It really is. I don't know if any of you have ever drank, but when alcohol <laughs> first entered my system, I thought, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Now, I may have to have a job and spend time in the so-called real world, but this, this is the real world. The other real world is not the real world. It's a place where you have to pretend a lot. But in this little bubble of alcohol, um, everything is shiny, everything glitters, and everything is slightly fuzzy. Um, the first time I got properly drunk, I was in Germany. I was hard as it may be to believe in a military band, and we were on tour in Germany. A British military band on tour in Germany, you don't get many of those. Um, and we were being hosted in Frankfurt, and uh, there's something in Frankfurt, I don't know if any of you have been to Frankfurt, but there's something at the time which was called the Apfelwein Express. And the Apfelwein Express was a, a, a tourist tram which ran around the centre of Frankfurt, and under there were these wooden benches, and under the benches were these crates of cider, uh, the Apfelwein. And now, this is interesting to me at any rate, when I walked into the tram, when I stepped onto the tram, I saw that I was 14, I saw these crates of cider, and I looked at the people around me, and I did a very rapid calculation. If you're an alcoholic, you get used to doing very rapid calculations. And I was worried that there wouldn't be enough for me. I'd never been drunk before, but I instinctively knew that this was going to be an issue. <laughs> Is there going to be enough for me? And I drank and drank and drank, and I looked at the people around me, and no one else was drinking the way I drank. And inside the tram, to me, everything was glittering. Uh, Frankfurt was whizzing past outside. It was December. Um, it was warm inside the tram, so the, the windows misted up. So this so-called tourist tram of Frankfurt, you couldn't actually see anything of Frankfurt. It was just this mist, and you had to rub the windows to see what was out there. The, the real world was now slightly murky. I couldn't see it. All I was aware of was the warm glow inside me, and it was as though the air was full of Christmas lights. This is what alcohol did for me. And, I mean, it's, you know, uh, 28 years later, is that, can that be right? It's 28 years later, and I remember that more clearly than anything in my childhood up to that point. This tells you something about the powerful effect of alcohol on someone like me. Um, people talk a lot about what alcohol does to them, and that's surely important, but what is important as well is to recognize what alcohol did for me. It instantly changed my perception of reality and turned the universe into a place, temporarily, that I didn't mind being too much. Um, when I was around 17 or 18, um, the headmaster of my school, I, I was sent to see the headmaster for something good, actually, that I'd done. And he said that um, when I first arrived at that school at the age of 14, I was like a little old man. But something had happened to me in the previous... I was 18, I think, at this point. Something had happened to me in the previous few months which had meant that I had flowered and become essentially who I was meant to be. And I had indeed flowered and become who I was meant to be. And the funny thing that had happened in those previous six months was I'd become a daily drinker. I had gin and vodka 
and blue curacao hidden everywhere. Uh, it was a boarding school. Uh, hidden everywhere. Uh, I, I constructed hidden cabinets to uh, house my alcohol. My supply was secure, I was safe, and every night I would get as drunk as possible. Um, it allowed me to operate in a world which was now safe because there was somewhere I could run away from, uh, run away to from the world. I had a, a hidey hole, I, I had an escape bridge, I had an escape hatch. Now this would be fine, I mean there's nothing wrong with alcohol, I and mean, a lot of people operate in the world dependent on one glass, two glasses, eighteen glasses of wine. Um, depending on your constitution, that may work for you. But I've got a couple of problems. Um, and my problems were not the arrests. My problems were not waking up so ill that I couldn't function that day. You hear a lot of dramatic stories in AA, and when I first came to AA, um, I'd say three quarters of the room were men over 50. And I was a bloke of sorts at the age of 21, and my story did not match the story of people who were... I, I had not lost a marriage or a house or a job, because I'd never had a marriage, a house or a job. I couldn't identify with lots of the external stories. Um, but I had a couple of problems with my drinking, and as soon as I identified these, I could identify an AA. And I have to say, for a long time in AA, I felt as though I was a fraud because I thought I had to identify with the external stories, the biographical stories, the disasters. Um, my two problems are these. When I have a drink, I don't know when I'm going to stop. Now, that doesn't just mean during the course of that evening. I mean, that's a fairly easy story to tell. There were times when I would meet someone for a drink at five or six in the evening, thinking, now, I really don't particularly want to go out on the town tonight. I don't, I, I don't want to go to, to the pub. I just want to have a few drinks, have a quiet time, go home, get stuff done, get up early tomorrow. There's an awful lot of pressure. And you, you get home at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, this is a fairly easy story to tell. This is a fairly common story to tell. And I won't labour that particular one. If, if you've had extensive experience of aiming to have a few drinks or a quiet night with friends and it turns into a frenzy and um, you, know, you drink to blackout, then this is a good sign that you're in the right place. But in 1991, I was sober for three months. I'd had a catastrophic time drinking. I, it was clear to me that even my drinking turned at the age of 18 pretty badly. Um, and I discovered I could no longer get to the place I needed to get to drunk. I would get physically drunk, but uh, I'd become crazed and crazy and even more desperate drunk than I was when I was sober. And where do you go then? You're a, the place you escaped to has become even more frightening than the place you've escaped from. And I decided I would go and stop drinking. And for three months, I was living in Finland at this point. Uh, for three months I didn't drink and I did my best to enjoy the <laughs> finished summer um, but I was uh, I was having an awful time frankly uh, I was even more insane sober over this period than I was when I was growing up I would um, sit in the middle of a very busy road near to a very fast road near to where I lived and uh, the cars would swerve around me because I wanted to die but I didn't want it to be my fault, I wanted to create an accident so I wouldn't be blamed. Um, but I was sober, and I didn't want to drink because I had a terrible memory of what the last few months, when I was 18, 19, I had a terrible memory of what those last few months were like, the uh, desperation, the inappropriate behaviour, uh, the, the sexually inappropriate behaviour. Um, and I thought, this is awful, but a drink won't help. And I can't get things done <laughs> when I'm drinking at all. I can't get things done. I'm too ill during the day. Um, and I was sober for three months. And I was desperately asking for help from all sorts of people. I didn't know who to ask help 
from. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know how to ask ask for help. Um, and people tried to help me, and they didn't help. Helping professionals tried to help me, but they couldn't help. Um, and I got back to London, and the first thing that I did was I got excited. I got excited at the prospect of drinking again. And my mind was filled with the same thoughts that they were, it was filled with when I was 14, 15, 16, 17. Where all I could think of was the joy and the excitement and the exhilaration and the promise and the possibility associated with having a drink. And I arrived in London, I met some new friends, and I started drinking. And something in my mind clicked after... I think it was a bottle of Cinzano. I, something in my mind clicked after the first bottle of Cinzano, and this desire to at least make something of myself in the world and live some kind of sober life left me after the first drink and didn't come back for, an, for another nine months. And this would keep happening for every summer. I'd get to um, May or June and the, the weight of the awful experience of drinking over the previous nine months would hit me all at once and I'd say, I can't do this anymore, I'm done, and I'd stop drinking. But when I started again, the resolve of the three months that I was so would go instantly. This is the effect of one drink. I can be absolutely convinced that I must stay sober, committed to staying sober, Sure, at a cellular level, that being sober, although difficult, although crazy-making, was the right way to proceed. I have one drink, and this plan is wiped from my mind. It's like a data disk being wiped, and it's replaced with a new plan, which is, I'm going to essentially live in the drunk world. I may need to spend some time every day in the sober world to get some money in order to sustain my drunk life, but it switches and I don't get to choose when it switches back. At one point, I started drinking again. It was a year and a half before it switched back, and I said, I want to be sober again. And I know today, if I stop what I'm doing in AA, if I have a drink, I don't know if the gift of grace to want to be sober would come back, and if so, how long it would take. I had some slips in AA after I came to AA, and in some of these cases, I came back the next day. In other cases, I didn't. In 1995, my best friend in AA drank, and it's 2014, and he's still drunk. Other people I saw drink and, and were dead the same day, or dead within weeks. So my two problems, the two problems which constitute my alcoholism, are number one, when I have a drink, I don't know if I'm ever going to stop. Number two, if you leave me sober for long enough, left to my own devices, all I see is the glow and the excitement and the joy and the exhilaration and the world of possibilities around a bottle of gin, a bottle of chinzana, a bottle of sherry. It doesn't matter what it is. And the rest of the world gets blocked out. And all I can think about is that is where I want to live. And no memory will stop me. No argument will stop me. No goodness will stop me. I have to do it. And the reason I'm still sober, I believe, is because the underlying problem has been solved. I was tense my whole life before I ever drank. And there was something terribly wrong, but I didn't have the words for it. And I was sitting on the admittedly being by Lake Geneva helps, but I was sitting on the on the wall out there thinking there is nothing wrong. This is just before the meeting, there is nothing wrong now. There is nothing there has never been anything wrong. There's been a barrage of thoughts in my mind at certain times telling me that everything is wrong, everyone is wrong, the world is screwed, there is no hope. But there was never anything wrong. I was never harmed. Now, how I got from there to here, I can't look back and, and I don't understand why, intellectually, why I was so unhappy as a child. I don't understand intellectually 
why I was so unhappy. I should add for many years sober, though that's not compulsory. We'll get on to that. But a change has happened. And there's a, a, a marvellous line in the big book where it, it, we talk about, it says, what has happened to us. And sometimes when people who've got a good programme in AA will convey that programme, they'll tell you all the marvellous things that they did <laughs> and how wonderful things are now. And, yeah, I've done, I've had to do those things. There's a lot of action in AA. There's a, there's a lot that has been required of me. But that is not what has kept me here. That is not what has solved the underlying problem. The thing that has solved the underlying problem is the grace of a power greater than me working initially through everybody else in AA and then, in, and then working through me to keep me here. I need to take some action to activate my faith. Uh, as a, a woman I met in Austin, Texas, said a number of years ago, I only met her very briefly, but the memory of her is said in my mind, you, you need to take action to activate your faith. God isn't going to slide a hot dog under your door. So yes, I've needed to take a lot of action in AA, but AA has essentially carried me for the last 20 years. If I meet the conditions, AA will carry me. And the only condition I needed to make when I was very new was I needed to follow the first instruction. When I phoned AA, a woman said, there is a meeting near you tonight. This was February 1993. And something in me was broken and said, I'm going to follow the instruction. So I sat in my bed for the next nine hours until it was time to go to the meeting. Uh, and I went to the meeting and I said, is this, I, I, I must have fumbled what I was saying. I must have been incoherent because there was enormous confusion when I arrived. Um, they tried to send me initially to an Alateen meeting down the road. So I, I looked around 16, 17. I hadn't been eating very much and I was sort of small and frail. Um, eventually they worked out I was indeed in the right place and they gave me half a cup of tea. And they sat me in the middle of the room and I felt a curious sensation which I was safe. What I had to do was follow the instruction, go to the meeting, follow the next instruction, take this cup of tea, sit there. And I took the cup of tea and sit there and didn't argue. I just waited for the meeting to happen to me. And that's been the story of the rest of the steps. Um, I didn't stop drinking straight away because... I mean, I have to say, I was surrounded by people in AA who were good people when I first got to AA. And there were people who were working the steps. There were people who had a program. There were people who were sponsoring. There were people who had a spiritual life. There were people who were praying, meditating, and making amends and doing all of these things. Now, the trouble is, there were lots of other people too who were great and kind and lovely. But when there are two people in the room who are working the steps and 19 who are not and come to AA and talking about their day and blah, blah, blah. How would you know that the two people, the two crazy people working the steps are the ones you need to listen to? They're in the minority. You're going to get, you're going to go with the majority. You're going to go with the consensus. And the consensus, what I was told as a major, the majority of the time was don't drink and go to meetings and you'll be fine. And I didn't drink, and I went to meetings, and then I drank, and I wasn't fine. And you see, I can't consistently follow the instruction, don't drink. So I don't tell people, don't drink. I'll tell people, if you comply with certain conditions, you'll be given the grace not to drink. Um, the first night I went to AA, I went home at the end of the meeting and I poured a bottle of gin down the sink. I'd never poured away a drop of alcohol in my life. I was given the power to do something which was be, would have been beyond my mind to conceive of. Now, initially, the shock of being surrounded by all this power in AA, that was enough. But there is something so powerful inside me. This is, there are two powerful forces in the universe. One is a power greater than myself. God working through people in AA now working through me. The other power is a destructive force within me. 
and that was in charge of my life. And as soon as I came to AA, that power was still growing, and that grew and grew and grew until a voice in set inside said me, you need relief, I know where the relief is. And the relief came in St. Peter's book in March uh, 1993 from a bottle of Hungarian brandy, which I knew as soon as I drank it was the wrong thing to do, but I had to carry on drinking. In July 1993, after an incident which involved a traffic accident and some policemen, I won't go into the details, um, something in me broke even further. And my story is a story of breaking. Something in me broke further, and for some reason, you see, when I break, I hear different things. I hear things I haven't heard before. I see people I haven't seen before, and a voice reaches me from them that hasn't reached me before. And a woman called Maureen, who was 19 years sober at the time, is still sober today. Maureen said, did you know you're dying? And I thought this was very impertinent, because people said... People had been saying it to me for months, did you know you're so lucky? You're so lucky coming to AA, so young, and you're going to be all right. And I didn't feel lucky. And when you're lying in the middle of the road and there is a car heading towards you at high speed, you are not okay. The people that said you're going to be okay were not were speaking from the heart, but they weren't speaking accurately. She said you're dying. And I knew she was being accurate. And that cut through all the sentiment. And I found a man called Doug who was not bothered remotely what people thought. He was just happy and cheerful in rooms of AA, which were sometimes not very happy and not very cheerful. And I was amazed. <laughs> I was amazed at this. There was a lightness and there was a buoyancy about him. And I said, what do I have to do? And now he gave me instructions over the following year, which were good and helpful. And I completed, I ran through the steps very quickly. I, I didn't have a, a strong concept of power greater than myself. The type of AA that I went to at this time was very much just follow the instructions you'll be absolutely fine and the funny thing was I did and it worked I didn't have any real concept of a higher power I remember it three or four months sober having a bad day and I was stuck in the middle of nowhere no mobile phones no internet and um, I opened the big book hoping <laughs> this might help and there was a chapter, We Agnostics, I had a vague idea of how great in myself might help, and I read the chapter, and it infuriated me, and I threw it across the room. But I was following the practical instructions I was given, and I was staying sober, and boy, was I doing better than the people around me who weren't, who were drinking, and some of them were dying. So I knew the instructions helped, and my, sponsor, my current sponsor, 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 says a lot of steps two and three are about taking actions you don't believe in because the people who are giving them are doing better than you. Doug was doing better than me. He was bright, he was successful, he was funny, he was relaxed, he had a bunch of friends, he had an amazing life, and he was doing better than me, so I just did what I was told. And I did a step four and five, which, you know, by my standards now was shoddy, but I told the truth, it was the best I could do, and I told the truth, and when I told the truth in step five, I realized at gut level, is this all, I was unhappy because of this, this material, on literally five pieces of paper. It was a terrible step four, but it was, the, it was an honest effort, and I told the truth, and it worked. And I made some, some, I made some amends, and there were, you know, based on how I make amends now, there were shoddy amends, there were, there were rotten amends. I wouldn't give you tuppence for how I made them, but I made them. And you know what happened? I stayed sober. Um, I had some effort at steps 10 and 11. I found meditation very difficult. I tried to go to meditation classes. I tried to read meditation books, uh, but I couldn't do it. Uh, I didn't develop a spiritual life. 
because I think the big reason was um, when you look up meditation in the dictionary now, it points you eastwards, points you towards Buddhism, it points you towards mindfulness, it points you towards specific postures, relaxing tapes, all these wonderful things. I'm not knocking these things, I think they're wonderful. You take an alcoholic who is mid-treatment and ask them to sit in a room, alone, cross-legged, with no external interference, and you ask them to quiet their mind. I became suicidal within seconds. I could not follow these instructions for long enough to get the benefit, because the noise in my head was too loud. So I didn't really follow a spiritual path. I followed a purely practical path. And I did sponsor people. I did a lot of service in my first five or six years. But something was happening, and I didn't know it was happening. My ego, which was so broken, which was broken sufficiently when I came into AA to follow instructions, was growing back. And... You know you've got an ego when you have a plan. And my plan was to make it, as we say in English. I was going to make it in the world. Now alcohol wasn't in the way. The world was my oyster. I could do what I wanted. And my idea of making it was, I need to get a career. I need to get a career in which I move fast, I progress rapidly. I rise up the level, I get money, I get power, I get prestige, I get security, so they can't get me. If you've got a concept of they, who are the ones who are going to get you, you might be ready for this program. I wanted to make myself safe. I thought I need a relationship, I need someone to look after me, who is going to stay with me, come what may. I need a mortgage, I need a pension. I need a big house in the suburb, in the suburbs, where I'm safe from poverty and from want and from fear. And I'm going to construct this. How am I going to do it? I need a position in AA. I need a good social set. I need to look good. I don't know why I thought I needed to look good physically. Uh, clothes. And I had a plan. And the thing is, when you're sober and you've been given half a program, and you're surrounded by people in AA who are very competent and very capable, you will be taught exceptionally well how to win at the game of life in the world's terms. And at eight years sober, I was the finance director of a dot-com in London. Uh, I was earning a lot of money. I had a big house in the suburbs. I had a boyfriend who I'd been with for many years who was in AA. We were very happy. We were very secure. I had the mortgage. I had the pension. I had an amazing set of friends from a social point of view. Um, they were wonderful, they were exciting, they were thrilling, they were a friends you could boast to your other friends about. That was the point of friends. It wasn't whether you enjoyed being with them, it's how impressive they were to your other friends. And if you left me alone for long enough to be aware of what was going on really underneath, I became suicidal and asked to Give me something to do. Give me something to distract. And I broke down rather spectacularly and became ill physically. And I went to AA and I said, what do I do? I went to the people around me and said, what do I do? And they said, go to lots of meetings. Get lots of service. And I've been doing lots of service. I've been going to lots of meetings. And I tried but I didn't find the solution I was looking for. So I left AA. I don't know if any of you have left AA. <laughs> but I did, and I didn't drink. But I became, over the course of two years, a recluse. Uh, I became stranger and stranger and more and more frightened until I was forced back to AA because I didn't know where, I didn't know where else to go. It had failed. <laughs> But I didn't know where else to go. And over the course of the next five years, which was a very painful five years in some ways, um, 
I found some people. I found some people not in my local groups. I found some people over the internet. I found some tapes. And I listened to these tapes. And I found tapes of people that talked about the doctor's opinion, what really made an alcoholic an alcoholic. And it wasn't the dramatic drinking story with the two features I talked about earlier. And then I found lots of Al-Anon tapes, and these explained my reaction to all of the alcoholics around me in AA. It explained my reaction to my parents. It explained why I was so affected by everybody around me. I then fortunately found tapes of people that talked about the promises in the big book. They talked about freedom from fear, they talked about living in a new and wonderful world, whatever their present circumstances. Now, I had read the big book a number of times by this point, and I agreed enormously with some of it. Uh, Bill W. in the chapter uh, where he tells his story talks about uh, the Bible, where some bits, the, some bits he agrees with hugely, the morality was impossibly good, in other parts were impossibly bad, and that was my attitude to the big book. There were some very good practical things, but there were some bits which were just poetic license. It was just Bill trying to sell something, and I would go to big book meetings and tell people, don't, don't take, take it with a pinch of salt, don't believe everything you read in this book. What I, what I heard these people saying was that if you haven't met the conditions for the promises to come true, don't be surprised if the promises haven't come true. Um, there are seven points in the big book where it describes, if you do this action, you will get drunk. If you don't do this action, uh, you will get drunk. And I looked at whether I was complying with these conditions. Now, I wasn't getting drunk, but I was close to it in many ways. In many ways, my life externally was very good. I was certainly doing better than lots of my friends, but there was a deep unease which hadn't been solved for 15 years sober. I was happy in some ways, but not functioning at a profound level. But I knew there was something deeply wrong. And I had to ask myself, am I fostering resentment? Am I harboring resentment? And yes, there was a lot of bitterness in my life towards my parents, towards my siblings, for instance. Secrets, oh boy, were there secrets. There were things I couldn't tell my AA group. There were things I hadn't told anyone. Um, were the creditors I hadn't faced? Yes, I'd built up amends over the previous 14 years since my first round of amends. Amends I hadn't made. Things I'd stolen sober, which I hadn't given back. Um, were there other amends I hadn't made? Absolutely. There were amends that I hadn't made the first time around. I'd been given license not to make them by people in AA. Well-meaning people said, you don't need to go back to exes, you don't need to go back to former partners, you don't need to go back to people who have harmed you. If you've harmed them, you have to make amends unless they've harmed you, in which case don't lie. Now, these people meant well, but I knew there was guilt, there was shame associated with these. Was I giving up much of my free time to help other people? Not really. I wasn't meeting the conditions for the promises. I decided that I was going to test what the big book said scientifically. And the only way to test it was take every action described in it and see what happens. And let's see whether these promises are real, whether they're a pile of rubbish. And over the course of three months, I did exactly what it said, word for word. I made every last amend that I could find. I had a list of, I came up amazingly with a list of 78 people. I, was, I couldn't believe that that list was there until I looked for it. I didn't find it. The roof of my head blew off, and I realized I'd been living my whole life under a blanket, and I hadn't been experiencing real life. I, I'd been experiencing this gray monotony, and I thought that was real life, but it wasn't. Over the last five years, my life has blossomed in an unbelievable way. And it happened because I met the conditions, and the conditions are not difficult. They're about an honest effort, but they're about an honest effort combined with a desire to complete what was started. I didn't complete what was started the first time. And I've been shown, I've fortunately over the last five years, been exposed to people who have shown me how to pray and meditate in a way that works for people who are crazy. 
a way to pray and meditate for people whose head is full of noise. I've been shown ways of helping people simply by showing other people what helped me. Uh, the gaps have been filled in. And what I'm looking forward to doing in conjunction with Laura for the rest of the day is to show you what was shown to me, to show you how to fill in the gaps so that hopefully you'll get the experience of AA that I've had over the last five years and not the experience I had in the first 15. I've had my 14 years, so I'm going to stop now. So thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.